remember what they have to offer. So just sit tight, pay attention, and they will be sharing their uh, courses soon very shortly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. He wants to. You want to swap? Do you want to switch over? Um, data is okay. 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 I'll start. Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Doreen from Algo Foundry. I'm here to tell you more about Algo Foundry ourselves, as well as the training courses that we currently have. So I believe you've seen our booth right outside the past few days. So we were giving out all the big straw bags and the pillows, things like that. So now I just want to tell you more about our training courses. Okay. Yeah, a little background about ourselves. We're actually a joint venture with our grand foundation as well as Undercurrent. So we actually assemble like-minded people. We empower them to be able to build um, depths that are special and unique. So essentially, Algo Foundry is a venture studio as well as a place where we provide developer training courses for the Algorand blockchain. Okay. Yeah. So currently we have three causes. We have the fundamentals, we have the developer, as well as the specialist. So for the fundamentals, um, it is designed to teach key concepts and skills to those who are interested in building the Algorand blockchain. So we'll cover things like um, introduction to Algorand, how to set up your node environment, um, creating accounts and wallets, managing your assets and also transactions. All right, and then we have the developer course. So for the developer course, um, this is for more intermediate level um, coders. So we'll cover things like the AVM, um, how to code in Teal, code in PyTeal, and also things like working with smart contracts. So through this course, you'll be able to create dApps and bring them to life. And then last but not least, we have the specialist certification. So for this, um, you're actually required to build an actual live dApp. And if you pass that, you'll be certified as an Algorand specialist. So yes, that's all the current courses that we currently have. And we are also offering a scholarship 100% subsidized by us. So if you are interested in knowing the promo codes, please find any of us who is dressed in this shirt and we'll provide that to you. All right, so now I'll pass the time to Rong Heng to take you through our workshops. Oh my God, we have passed to you this. I have it, I have it. This is another one, this is Okay. Yeah, hi guys, I'm Rong Heng. So um, today we're going to do some uh, bit of a workshop here. So we're going to talk about uh, front end integration, um, front end integration with smart contracts, and we're going to go through a bit about smart contracts using PyTeal. And then we're also going to uh, have some hands on time later on, and then uh, I'll go around and I'll, you guys can ask me any questions, and I'll try my best to answer them. Uh, some of my colleagues here are here as well. You can also ask them. Uh, they're in the the foundry, oh, foundry shirt. So yeah, and then uh, we also talk a bit about wallet integration because uh, you always need a wallet, right, uh, on uh, Web3 to integrate uh, to interact with smart contracts. So that's what we'll be doing as well, and a bit of that. And then we'll end with some uh, Q and A. All right. So firstly, uh, smart contract integration. So Basically, you would have to have uh, smart smart contracts already, obviously, uh, already written. So later, um, later on, I'll provide some links. You guys can download some code uh, that we have uploaded on GitHub that will help you to get started with a simple smart contract boilerplate. And then we'll actually try and do some uh, smart contract integration, basically interacting with smart contracts uh, using code, and then you know trying to make uh, uh, smart contract calls and, and basically interacting with smart contracts on the algorithm blockchain. So there's some prerequisites, so I hope that you know earlier in the day you guys have got your environment set up and stuff. Um, some prerequisites like we need like Docker and we'll also be working with the Algorand sandbox, which is basically a sandbox environment that allows you to simulate a uh, algorithm blockchain locally on your environment and uh, is run in Docker container, so that will help you to quickly develop dApps and also help you 
um, quickly iterate on the dApps and you know make fixes, make improvements quickly so that you know you don't have to spend like uh, real tokens. You can simulate this locally with, uh, on your on your laptop and you know create dApps on the fly. So and obviously we will have some. Uh, you have you also need Node.js and Python as well because uh, we'll be using some JavaScript to actually interact with the smart contracts. And then we'll also be using some um, Python, which will be uh, for the smart contracts, which is to uh, write the smart contracts, because we are writing smart contracts in PyTil. So I think PyTil is one of the more popular languages now for algorithm smart contract development. So that's what we'll be uh, focusing on and working with. Yeah. So let's begin with the first one. Um, you guys can um, go ahead and you know, visit this link and basically you can clone the repository and then right now we'll start going through the workshop, right? It's like a hands-on thing. So I will give you guys uh, a few seconds to, to type down the link. Everyone okay? Everyone got the link? Shall we? So let's do this together. Alright, let's visit the link. So this is the demo. So I'm just going to quickly clone the code here. So um so like the prerequisites are stated. Um you need to have Docker installed, so this is uh, the Docker desktop for Mac. And then you also have uh, have a few things running, which is the algorithm sandbox. Uh, which, if you do a quick Google search, um, algorithm sandbox, you can see the first one. So there's some instructions here. So I've got a sandbox up already because I'm going I'm going straight in and running with the sandbox, and we're sure we're going to go through some uh, smart contract code. So here's some instructions on how to set up the uh, algorithm sandbox. So once you have it set up here, you will have it here. And this is my sandbox, basically on the top left um, terminal. Um, maybe it's easier if I, yeah. You can see it over here. And then to check that it's running, I'm just going to push some basic um, sandbox commands. Um, So this is my local sandbox. You can see there's a sync time and there's a last committed block and stuff. So this will tell you like uh, things whether the whether the blockchain is sync locally or not. So if you see a sync time of uh, zero or something close to zero, means uh, that means your blockchain is up to date and stuff. So this is not really uh, relevant relevant for a local blockchain because it will always be up to date when you spin it up. But let's say you're testing on testnet and you're ready to go on mainnet and stuff, you want to check that your node is always up to date because uh, you want to have the latest version of the, the blockchain. You know, you want to be in sync with the blockchain. Oh, okay, you can do that. Just run it again, right? And then if you can see, um, you can see the Genesis ID. This is called Sendnet on your grant. So this will give you your local blockchain environment that you can work with and work on. So next, um, let's go to the link here, and I'm going to clone the repository here. And we can immediately begin on working with the demo. So, okay, I'm um, just going to a new directory and then I'm going to clone it. So, quickly, I'm going to open a visual code. 
So this is the repository that I just uh, downloaded. This big now. So over here, I'm just going to run some um, comments. So there's actually a readme inside with some instructions on how to get this set up. So let's look at that. Okay, so you know we have to basically do some basic installation of the, the packages and stuff. Okay, and then um, basically update some um, configuration files and then uh, basically run the application. So what this is, right? Um, it's actually this one. Sorry, that was the wrong one. Uh, sorry, that's another workshop. Um, let's open the correct one here. Yep. That's the one. Okay. So yeah, this is a simple um, smart contract with a simple uh, JavaScript on the front end. So firstly, we are going to go through the, the smart contracts. So if you go into the smart contract directory, so you can see here, um, you have the smart contract and then we have some scripts here and then some installation to be done. So Firstly, you need Python, um, and that will help you uh, install some of the, the libraries required, like PyTeal, which will help with the language for um, algorithm smart contract development that we're going to use for this demo. Um, you can do a Python tree uh, or pip tree. So you pass it to a file, you use the dash r uh, to recursively install all the libraries required. So uh, you can see Grammar already satisfied for me because I've already installed these libraries. But I'll give you some time to, to run this uh, setup. Right? Anyone need more time? No? OK, I'll move on. And then next, uh, we're going to go through the smart contracts in a bit. So there's a script here. So let's go through what it does. Um, yeah. So this is the smart contract. So this is written in PyTeal. You can see we have um, two major functions, two main functions. So this is a clear application and a proof application. So this is actually a stateful smart contract, uh, which means that in this smart contract, you can actually store information. And there's a memory for you to store the, um, any information that you need in the smart contract. So um, on Algorand, uh, stateful smart, uh, smart contract always has a clear application and a proof application. So there's two main applications, uh, two main functions. And then you will have, uh, you'll see that uh, you'll have a few um, predetermined um, functions here. So on Algorand, when you, when you deploy a contract and on a, a stateful smart contract, and you, when you try to call it, you'll see that there's a few different types of application calls that you can call. So if we go down to this portion over here, you can see that we have defined uh, a few things that, that are the types of uh, application call that, we can call that we can call on. So if you go to on create, this means that on the smart contract creation, you will run this piece of code. So this smart contract application is basically a, a simple boilerplate um, that has an uh, admin, admin address. So what it does this is basically storing, um, as you can see here, the creator address inside, inside the state of the smart contract. So this is actually common on, in many smart contracts uh, in the sense that you know, you wanna, you wanna, if you want to manage the smart contract or if you want to keep some kind of administrative access to the smart contract or if you want to uh, build some features that are uh, administrative, then you, you want to know who is the, the admin, right? Which 
which accounts that I mean, and you want to be able to to basically um, retain control of the contract. So, um, simple thing here. So it's just setting the the creator address as the owner, and returning one. So one means uh, successful. And then you can see here. Next one we have is on update, uh, on delete, and also on opt in. This three. Uh, I'll explain the first one. So on, we are rejecting all three. So we're rejecting this uh, on update and delete. What that means is. When you try to update the smart contract, because on Algorand you can actually call the update function to update the smart contract, and that will actually you know replace the smart contract with the, any updated version of the smart contract you want. So it's it's slightly different from um, other blockchains, where you have like for example on the EVM blockchain, um, you might want you you can't really update the smart contracts unless you use a different pattern, like if you use like a proxy smart contract, you know with a different smart contract. Design, then you are able to update the smart contracts. But on the Algorand, this feature is built in, so you can actually just update your smart contracts uh, with with the update call. So in this case, uh, we don't want our smart contract to be updatable. This can be for for trust reasons. You know, if you don't want to surprise your users by, hey, we're just going to update our smart contract and change some code that may or may not be malicious. So most most of the time, we will always reject the update and um, delete uh, application calls. So on delete, uh, it's also the same. Um, delete is basically allowing you to delete the smart contract. So we also don't want to allow anyone to delete the smart contract. So we are rejecting these two calls here. And then this is the opt-in. So on Algorand stateful smart contracts, right? you have this thing called opt-in. So what this does is, you approve the smart contract to basically, um, and then you spend some algos with SPs, and this will allow the smart contract to write to a state, uh, a local state. So what this means is, this allows the smart contract to store information uh, that is related to your account. So if you allow that, um, yeah, then the smart contract can basically um, store any information that it needs on your account. So this is actually uh, useful because uh, smart, stateful smart contract itself, although it has a global state, it might not be enough. That there, there is a uh, there is not enough uh, storage for like all the users. Let's say if you are deploying a smart contract and you have you're expecting like over a thousand users, and you have a lot of information you want to store, it's not possible to store it on just the smart contract itself because of the, the storage limitations that we have now. But if you use the local state, you can actually you know, scale this up and you can store every user's information on their local state, which is on their account. And then this is the close out. So for the close out, we will usually reject the call. So this close out, what it does is, basically is the reverse action of the opt-in. This will actually opt out of the smart contract and also clear any information on the user's local state. So if you don't want the user to, to be able to opt out uh, because you know, if they have some info, important information, like for example, if we are doing a smart contract that is storing how much tokens you know, this, this guy is, has stored in the smart contract, then we want the user to not be able to, to clear this information, if not, they will not be able to re, uh, redeem their tokens later on. So you might want to run some logic here first, you know, checking if the user has tokens remaining in the smart contract before actually approving or rejecting this call. So this is actually up to you. And then this is the no op call, which is actually the default um, app call for Algorand. And any application call, you know, by default you will call the no op call. And then here, since uh, this is a boilerplate admin smart contract, we have the update owner function. So you, here you see a couple of things. Um, basically, what this function does is that it updates the owner. 
So for example, if if your account has been compromised or or some or when or the main owner is is uh, trying to change the owner, you can actually call this function to change the smart contract owner to another account. So this is how you do it. The execution is mainly only one line, where we update the global state variable to the account that you the account address that we pass in to the app call. However, um, we have many many assertions here, as you can see. So on a smart contract, you always want to verify as many things as possible. This is for security reasons. And here you can see that we are verifying a few things. We are verifying that you know the sender is the current owner of the smart contract, because we don't want anyone to be able to, to update themselves as the owner of the smart contract, right? So this is fairly obvious. And then we also want to check group size equals to one. So what this means, right? In Algorand, you can actually have multiple transactions bundled together before you submit it to the blockchain. So these are called uh, group transactions. So you can group man multiple transactions together and submit it to the blockchain, and they will all execute at the same time. So this is, this is called atomic. So if it's atomic, that means if one of the transactions is successful uh, and, and some of the other transactions in the same group are, are some unsuccessful, then they will all fail. So this is like an all or nothing behavior. So you need all the transactions in the group to be successful for this transaction, for this group transaction to be successful. So we also want to check that the group size is one because in, in certain cases, the user can submit a group transaction where it passes all the validation checks that we have in the smart contract, but in subsequent transactions, they, are, they can perform a malicious uh, app call, maybe they try to withdraw funds from the smart contract and, and other things. So we also want to make sure that this is also one of the validations that we're going to check for. And then next, we also have wiki2. So wiki2 is basically an algorithm-specific feature. It's only specific to algorithm. I think no other blockchains has this. So wikiing is basically um, allowing a account to basically delegate your, your um, permission to, to send transactions to another account. So you're kind of delegating your rights to another account. So what this, what this means is that, let's say if I rekey a transaction, let's say I have account one and she has account two, and I rekey to her, that means I cannot send transactions from my address anymore. The, the transaction will fail. So only she has the authority to, to sign transactions for me. So that's, that's how rekeying works. And we also want to set, check that this rekey, this field in the transaction, is equals to zero, the zero address. Because this can be very malicious, in the sense that, um, let's say if, if I make an app call and, and if this transaction is successful, you know, somebody put some address, or maybe they put their own address in the rekey, they are basically, um, they, you basically lost control of your account because this guy just rekey your account to his account. So this is also an important check. And then we also have this accounts, uh, checking that the number of accounts that we are passing into the smart contract call is one. It's also uh, fairly obvious because you don't want the user to pass in more than one account that you're trying to update uh, on the smart contract. And also the last check, that the account that they're passing in is not a, it's not a zero address. So yeah, so this is just a simple boilerplate smart contract with uh, the admin function. So we have went through a number of uh, type of app calls on a smart contract. So what this does, uh, we have went through all of this, and then uh, update, delete, opt in, close out, and then we have the router. So what this is, right, uh, is that we have created a router here to basically allow you to do multiple types of smart contract calls. So as you can see, right, the on complete type, so on the on complete type of this transaction is, is no op. So that means if you want to implement more than one function on a smart contract, the, the, the type will always be a no op call. 
So that means if you want to implement more than one function, you should implement some kind of a router such that you can um, have different methods, uh, different functions on the smart contract, and then you know you can actually add plenty of uh, features to your smart contract. So this is this is usually how we do it. And then you have um, two more functions here, which basically just compiles the smart contract. Uh, so this is written in PyTeal. We will compile this to native uh, Teal, which is the algorand uh, smart contract language. And then, uh, yeah, so that's the smart contract. So far, does anyone has any question regarding this smart contract? Sorry? The rekey. Okay. Sure. So rekeying. Uh, yeah. So this is a very specific algorithm. So, for example, I have an account, right? Let's call this account A. And I have. Yeah. So when I say account, this is referring to my my wallet, right? So when I have this account, right now, I own the account. And I can send transactions from this account, I can send funds, I can send tokens from, from me to anyone else. I have control of this account. However, in, in certain use cases, um, which is very useful that, that this reking is on algorithm, in certain use cases, let's say, I only want to use this account for one purpose, and after that, I don't want to be able to, to, for anyone to use this account, but I also don't want to use this account anymore in the sense that uh, it's a one-use account, but I still want to, to keep control of it. So for example, uh, I think this, is, this can be used in the sense, let's say I want to deploy some smart contracts, and I only want this account to have one purpose, which is to deploy smart contracts. So what I can do is, I can deploy smart contracts with this account, and then I can rekey it to her, to a second account, which I will be able to control the smart contract in the future, right? So I don't have to, you know, use the existing account. Maybe because when you deploy the smart contracts, you already have your mnemonic um, touch a certain device, and, and that's a security thing, right? Because if it touches a certain device, and this device has a connection to the network, which is the internet, that means it's exposed to the internet in some ways, and Although you, you're not sure whether this can be secure or not, I mean, you can play safe and you can rekey your account to another account, which has, could be a hardware wallet and that has never touched the internet before, right? So this is more of a, a security feature and also it can come in many, it has many convenient use cases as well. Does that answer your question? Thanks. Okay, so next. Um, oh, one question. No. Line number 14. Line number 14. So, uh, yep. It's supposed to be only one account, right? Uh, we are taking that as the only one, right? But we are comparing it with index 1 and not 0. Yes. So, yes, this is also an algorithm thing. So, if you look at the accounts array in the transaction, when you, you look, when you see it from the smart contract, um, and also, this is also in the PyTeal documentation. This is this is pretty nice. So, if you want to know who is the the sender address, is always in account zero. This is this is kind of like pre predetermined the algorithm thing. So, any variables, any accounts that you pass to the app call, will always start from one. Yeah. Yep. I'm not confused. Just buy some tokens from uh, Algorand. Okay. Like, so, let's see how we do it. One way, one way to buy tokens. Now, buy the placement contract, which is the, the owner. So, if you see here, update owner, which is from the router, right? we define it as uh, update owner. So this will tell the smart contract, oh, this is actually update owner uh, function call, application call. So that's why we, we define it like as this. Also, for 
application arguments in algorand they have to be formatted a certain way this, this is why you see us doing a few things so this is basically a string update owner but we also have to convert it into a unit array so this is this are the data types that um, algorand is uh, algorand works with that's why we have to use the specific data types for for application calls if you if you mouse over um, the function which is make application call so this the details here are from the algorand sdk they will tell you um, what kind of uh, parameter types you need and if you look at application arguments it's, it's a uin8 array so there's there's also a bunch of uh, formatting to be done when you're working with uh, algorand applications yeah and then since we are updating the owner we are going to pass in the new owner address here which is in the accounts array so one thing um yeah so after that once we have the, the transaction object we created it we have to submit it within uh, a thousand blocks because based on the params here uh, which we fetched from the blockchain we have to submit it, this transaction you know so, as soon as possible within a thousand blocks if not this transaction will no longer be valid when you try, try to submit it later in the future and then this will help us get the transaction id which is the transaction hash which identifies uh, how, how unique uh, each transaction is and then over here which you can see is similar to the code we have earlier this is to sign the transaction and it signs the transaction object with our um, private key which is derived from the mnemonic and that will help us uh, yeah, to validate that we are actually the correct sender of this transaction and then we will send the transaction to the blockchain and wait for the transaction to be confirmed by the blockchain right, so yeah this is the simple example of, of our front end UI integration with the smart contract so far does anyone have any questions regarding this or if you are actually trying this out on your own you can also ask me anybody okay. guess not guess not okay let's move on Right, let's go back. So this is the workshop. And so I will briefly talk about this. Okay, so for front end, um, obviously what we have done is a very simple example of how to in interact with the smart contract from a front-end um, JavaScript-based application. So usually that's not how it works on Web3, right? Usually people will have to connect your wallet because obviously nobody wants to give you their mnemonic over the internet and, and that's not a very good thing. So over here, we are going to talk um, briefly about wallet integration. So again, um, I have some GitHub repository that you guys can refer to on how to do this and also uh, the prerequisites which is the same as what we did uh, what we had earlier yeah so this is uh, actually a my algo wallet an example that uh, Renlabs made so um, you guys can actually copy down this link and look at the example this is actually a very good example on uh, with a simple front end how you can connect to the algorand uh, blockchain with uh, my algo wallet and and also make some transactions that do not require you to review your your secret key and stuff to to the application yeah so i'm going to give you a bit few, few seconds to copy this down three Right, let's move on. Take a picture. Okay. Alright, so let's 
we are going to end. So you guys can actually try out the application that uh, the link that I sent earlier. You can try out yourselves how to work with uh, algorithm wallet. And also based on the previous code example that I went through, you guys can try to integrate that and use your wallet to basically interact with a smart contract. Anyone got any questions? Okay. All right, let's break for a short while and then we'll come back. And then uh, we'll be talking about smart contract security after this. So uh, we'll be back after a short break. Thank you, guys. Come on, yeah. <laughs> From my experience, um, it depends actually whether you already have um, some web development knowledge because it's, it's actually really tied closely to, to web development, web 2 stuff because you know it's web 3 right so it's a step up from there so if you're already a web developer it shouldn't take you a couple of it should take you about a couple of months to, to get up to speed and if you are familiar with blockchains and, and other existing web 3 technologies um, yeah it should take you even shorter than that so yeah and also the algorithm um, developer documentation actually is uh, improving like really quickly over the, over the uh, months actually at a rapid pace so actually the documentation is really good now they have very specific examples and covers many many use cases that you can actually look at to actually create any kind of uh, application that you might want to create okay thanks Rohing and Nari um, we will just take a short break for like five minutes and they will come back to talk about that security as well. Alright. Thank you. Do Thank you, need you guys. To log in this? Is it if you're on this laptop? Um, okay. So you want to check that the group size is exactly uh, what you're expecting here. So if your group transaction is expecting three transactions, you should expect the group size to be exactly three. So yeah, this is a very important validation because somebody can intercept your transaction and sneak in a, a separate transaction that basically maybe uh, do a payment transaction to themselves. So you want to make sure that nobody can, uh, when your transaction is intercepted, nobody can sneak in like a, an extra transaction. And then we have the sender and the receiver. So yeah, this is a pretty basic check here, uh, but you still must validate it uh, for specific app calls, like the example I had in the previous talk, which is to update the owner address. You want to check that the sender is actually the correct sender you know, that you have stored in Google State, or if you're expecting some other address or other variables, uh, that should be validated. Same for the receiver, whenever possible, you should always validate the receiver. Although the receiver is actually validated um, on Algorand natively um, to be the, the actual receiver, which is uh, if you're calling a smart contract, it will be a smart contract. Uh, but sometimes if your uh, smart contract is doing something unique, something different, and you're expecting a different receiver, you should always validate this field. Okay? And then this is the group index. So group index is something um, also pretty special to Algorand because uh, when you have group transactions in Algorand, the position and the ordering of the transactions in a group actually matters. So for example, if I'm making a group transaction of, of size two, let's say I have a payment transaction as my first transaction, and then I have an application call as my second transaction, I need to validate the position of each transaction. So I need to validate that my first transaction at position one is actually a payment transaction, and then validate on position two is actually uh, the correct the correct index, which is the application call. So for every um, validation for for if you're expecting group transactions, which I guess uh, many smart contracts are using, you need to validate the group index for group transactions. So this is actually something very important as well. However, if you are 
um, having some, if you want to allow some dynamic kind of uh, trans group transaction where you, um, when you can have dynamic ordering of the transactions, um, that is usually not recommended. It's better to just craft the transaction exactly the way you want in the exact order that you want. But you can still do the, the kind of dynamic validation you know, just by changing um, the assertion to like a group index um, minus one or plus one. You, know. you can add some uh, addition or subtractions here you know, to, to actually uh, look at the transaction before this transaction or look at the transaction after this transaction uh, by how many places and stuff. So you can still do that, but it's a lot more complicated and, and you have a lot more each cases to think of for your validation for, for smart contract security. Okay? Right. Um, it's been short talk, so guys have uh, any questions regarding smart contract security, especially on PyTeal? Yes? Yep. Um, it's more like okay. Back to Wikin. So it's more like the the Wikid account um, actually relinquishes control. So it gives up gives up control to the to the regular account. So in this case here, we have the Wikid account which gives up control to the, to the standard account here. So that means if the Wikid account, uh, let's say it has a balance of uh, two elbows there, I think I'm right, um, yeah, two elbows there, and then you know, it wants to spend that two elbows, it has to, that transaction has to be signed by the standard account. It cannot be signed by, by uh, the Wikid account. So it's basically uh, giving your authorization for signing transactions uh, to another account. So that, that's what it is. Does that answer your question? So that means if the standard account is compromised, mm -hmm. uh, we cannot use the Wiki account to recover the funds. Um, so let's say the, there's a few scenarios that can happen here. So let's say your standard account is, is compromised. Um, the attacker or malicious actor might not necessarily know about the wiki account. So um, if he tries to do some transactions on the standard account, he, won't, he will not be able to do them. The algorithm blockchain will basically reject this transaction. However, if your wiki account is compromised, um, the attacker has, actually has to be pretty savvy. He has to be able to know how to um, uh, analyze blockchain transactions to see if there was a wiki transaction that happened in, in, the, in the account's history. So in a sense, um, your, your account can still be safe, uh, but you will not have control of your account. But yeah, that's a different scenario. I hope that answers your questions. Any more questions? Can I ask, uh, go back to what, ask your in-house, Mm -hmm. um, your PSL is uh, analyzed off chain, right? Um, yes, this is uh, off chain. So we have uh, off chain agents that processes uh, all the rules that we want to monitor and, and basically um, execute some action based on uh, what we implement. Okay, my question is this DSL is rule, sort of rule based? Analysis is not done by AI or ML or Neuro? No. No, yeah. Um, another reason is because uh, you have the smart contract, right, written by humans. And Algorand is pretty new on the, I mean, it's not pretty new, but the smart contracts are actually evolving pretty fast. So we have came up with uh, EVM version, a uh, couple of versions just, just in the past few months. So. Uh, you actually require a human to actually analyze how the smart contract uh, and its surrounding threads, because this thread can not only be on-chain threads, can also be you know other other forms of threads that that is not uh, exactly correlated. So the the analysis actually covers a bunch of other areas around the smart contract that is not correlated that that we can handle and it has to be handled uh, off-chain. Would answer your question? Yeah. 
All right, do we have any more questions? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I can I can upload these slides uh yeah later on. Alright, now we have um another GitHub repo that we can all try to clone. Um, so this is actually a bonus. This is a course assignment from one of our uh Elgo Foundry courses. So what we have here is, is basically a showcase of uh, one of the course assignments, you know some exposure as to what the our course will be teaching about. And basically, it's a simple example here. Uh, there is a question on the branch, uh, on, the, on the code base, and there is also um, all the scripts set up for you that you can and run yourself. And there's also a solution as well. So after you complete the assignment, you can actually look at the solution to see if you're actually correct. So this assignment is about uh, a game, uh, a monster game. So I will just show you. Yeah. So this is about a game. You know, it creates a monster uh, with a, with five hit points, right? So basically, the the reward of the game is to basically uh, damage the boss, uh, the monster, with uh, as many damage points as possible. And the highest uh, player that does the most damage is awarded one elbow uh, by the contract creator. So uh, this is a larger smart contract with uh, more features than the one I showed you in the, in the previous uh, demo. But uh, this is one of our course assignments. So what we have done is uh, we have all the features implemented. But if you want, you can. Um, Start from scratch, uh, write your smart contract on scratch from scratch, and actually try to implement this this game, and look at the solution later on to see you know if you are correct. Uh, we also have removed all the validations, so all the assertions regarding smart contract security. So it's uh, something you can try out on. You can try to look at the functions on the smart contract. You can try to um, add these security checks that we just talked about. Um, and then compare that against the solution. So there's there's a couple of branches here. Uh, there's a main, which is the code base itself, uh, with the functions implemented. And there's also a solution, which implements all the validations. So that is your solution for, for um, smart contract security. So this is a, a bonus. Uh, repository they can download. So this is a demo for our one of our course, course assignments. Uh, give you a few seconds, you know, you can play with it when, on, on your own, own time. Okay. Alright, I'm moving on. So let's talk about our courses again. So just coming back again and talking about our causes. We have three causes. Um, and if you are a beginner or you're an experienced developer, just feel free to reach out to us. We have promo codes which will provide like 100 percent scholarship right now. So any of us wearing this shirt, please find us and we will provide you with that promo code. Yeah. So please also scan our QR code. You can find out more about us, our website, everything is right there, our email address as well. Um, yeah, so that's it. We're from Alpha Foundry, and thank you so much for listening. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Elbow Foundry. If you guys want to find out more, please feel free to hit them up. They'll be right at the back of the hall. You can also look out for anyone wearing those t-shirts as well. They'll be here the whole day until 6 to actually answer any questions. If you do need the slides, rest assured that in the Hack Shack info guide, that will be provided to you. So not to worry, if you need any help, that's always available. Now, 